It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Nicole uh, Lazar. Uh, Dr. Lazar is a professor of statistics at Penn State University. Uh, she used to be a professor at uh, UGA in our neighborhood, and Georgia unfortunately lost her to, to Penn State after she'd been at Georgia for 16 years, she was telling me. Uh, and uh, notably, uh, Dr. Lazar is a fellow of the American Statistical Society, fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and a leader in, 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 in many aspects of statistical thinking. She was the ex -edit she's the ex-editor of uh, the American Statistician, which is the leading statistic journal in the country. And uh, relevant to today's uh, talk, uh, which is a very important talk, it's about the whether we are approaching the end of statistical significance, whether you know, we're going to break away from the rote kind of approach of uh, statistics where we have a, a decision based on a p-value to a more thoughtful approach of interpreting data and providing support. That's the whole idea. And a few years ago, uh, the, uh, the American statistician, uh, they published a special issue uh, on this particular topic with 43 very detailed papers and a curated editorial. And uh, Nicole Lasser was one of the uh, authors of that editorial as editor of the journal. Uh, and I thought that editorial, when I read that editorial, it, it beautifully summarized uh, the entire issue. And even me as a non-statistician, a physician by background, I was, uh, you know, was, uh, could learn something. And I read several of those articles. What I liked about this particular issue was that it, it went beyond asking people to give up p-values, but actually uh, coming up with alternatives, practical alternatives. And what I particularly enjoyed, again, when I went back to Fisher's original paper, Fisher had never meant for the p-value to be arbitrarily used as a decision point. He wanted people to think about data. So in some sense, it's very, it's keeping, remaining loyal to Fisher's original philosophy. So with that, uh, Nicole, uh, it's really your talk. And so uh, we have an hour. We have about 100 people already and people are rapidly joining us. So it's going to be very popular. Looking forward to this uh, uh, educational seminar from you. There's a mixture in the audience. There are some who are very savvy statisticians, but a lot of users of statistics. So it's really up to you. Take, take it away. Hey, no worry. Well, thanks, Vincut, for that very nice introduction. And thank you for having me here today. Um, let me share my screen. Um, oops. Sorry. Okay, can you see my slides? Can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and are they moving forward? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, um, so I cannot easily monitor um, questions, but if there are questions, I guess, please um, put, put them in the chat and I will get to them at the end of the talk. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully we'll have some time for conversation. So um, I've titled this talk, The End of Statistical Significance with a question mark. Um, and the, the punctuation issue is one that's actually caused me a fair bit of anguish because I don't know whether I should end it with a question mark, an exclamation mark or a period. Um, I think the question mark is sort of the fairest assessment of where we are currently. And so that's why I'm leaving it there, but I hope that someday I can move it to a different punctuation point. Um, so in a nutshell, we're talking about p-values today. And this cartoon from XKCD summarizes some of the issues actually pretty well. Um, so, you know, we're all used to, we see the small p-values that gets interpreted as a highly significant result, which we'll talk about exactly what that means. Um, if we're at a 0.04 or 0.049, that's significant. But then as we get towards that 0.05 and a little bit higher, then different sorts of language start to creep in. And this is, this is done with a sort of a humorous vein, but um, it's actually quite uh, a serious issue, which, I'm, which I will um, talk about a little bit more. And then if, as we get up to this level of 0.1, then we start doing other things like a subgroup analysis. Okay. Oops. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about what some people call the cult of significance testing, and uh, hopefully make clear why why there's this sense among some people that this is actually sort of a rote and cult kind of way of thinking about things and not doing statistics the way that statisticians might prefer it to be done. 
So here are some examples of how people describe p-values that are around but greater than 0.05. I'm not going to go through all of them because I've got three pages of slides here and it would be just a little bit too much, but I want to just kind of give you a chance to look at some of these and highlight a few of them. Um, so we have things like a clear tendency to significance when p is 0.052, a little significant when p is less than 0.1, a non-significant trend towards significance at p.1, a slight slide towards significance, approached but fell short of, um, Closely not significant for P of 0.06, but also closely significant for P of 0.058. Flirting with conventional levels of significance just at the conventional level of significance just failed to be significant. And more, tottering on the brink, likely to be significant. Medium level of significance, near nominal, near certain, not absolutely significant, but very probably so, and on and on and on. Um, when I give this talk to statisticians and I show them some of these quotations, I see eye rolls in the audience. Um, I can't see any of you, so I don't know if any of you are rolling your eyes, but these are not terms that carry any statistical meaning to them. Something is significant in a formal sense or it's not significant in a formal sense. And yet, because we have so ingrained, re researchers and actually statisticians as well, to a large extent, have so ingrained this idea of this threshold of 0.05 being the make or break point, then researchers will often twist themselves into almost poetic levels of language to try to justify and explain their results. And all of these, quote, these, these, these languages all appeared in peer reviewed articles. So these are not things that are being made up. This is not the XKCD cartoon. This is real life. Okay, these are things that were actually published in journals. Um, so if you're interested in looking at more, I've only, I've, I've picked, a, I picked some that I thought were particularly interesting um, or amusing. There's a whole website dev devoted to these. You can look at and see um, different ways that people have described their not quite statistically significant results. Now you might say, well, this is from 2013. Clearly things have changed since then. So here's another example. Um, this example was sent to me a couple of months ago, it's from a paper that appeared in 2016. Uh, on the x-axis here, we have age less than 40, age greater than 40, and we have the y-axis shows age. So we have the distribution of the ages for the group that is less than 40, and compared to the distribution of the ages of the group that's greater than 40, and lo and behold, there's a statistically significant difference between the two groups. This was published in a journal. So what's wrong with this picture? I saw somebody in the comments typed a law, LOL, indeed, right? We bifurcated on age, and then we test to see if there's a statistically significant difference between the two age groups. So clearly there's going to be because we created it that way. And yet this test had a p-value attached to it. Okay, 2016, so maybe Things have gotten better since then. Uh, so a couple months ago, I just opened the journal cell, a random volume, random issue, a random article, and I found this. So they talk about statistical tests that they used. Um, they did multiple test p-values, adjusting using uh, false discovery rate methods, uh, correlation coefficients determined by Spearman method, and they set statistical significance to be at p less than 0.05. So I've highlighted this here for you. And here's a figure, this is just one example of a figure that appeared in that paper. And in fact, there are many figures like this and they all have a similar flavor to them. And if you look at them, you see these, these distributions and they've got stars and multiple stars and lots of stars. And if you look at the uh, caption, then one star is P less than 0.05, two stars is P less than 0.01, three stars is less than P001 and so on. So we see that these are indicating levels that are less than 0.05, in some cases much less than 0.05. But at the same time, at the, they said in their methods that they set the statistical significance at p less than 0.05. This is a problem because once you start looking at these other levels, then I no longer know whether I've controlled my type one error. Set, you set your significance level, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, moving forward. You set your significance level to control the type of type one error rate. In other words, falsely rejecting a null hypothesis that you shouldn't. Once you start to bring in these other levels, these other considerations, then it's no longer clear whether you've done that or not. And so there's a real muddling of sort of statistical concepts here 
demonstrated in a plot like this. So this is, relative, this is very recent, things have not necessarily changed. This is a very old conversation. Um, Venkat was mentioning at the beginning some of the reading that he had done looking um, at Fisher's original work, and I want to bring this in here as well. So not only Fisher, but other pioneers in statistics 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, writing about some of these issues. So here's a quotation from Ewell in 1911. Um, in the examples we have given, our judgment whether P was small enough to justify us in suspecting a significant difference has been more or less intuitive. Most people would agree the probability of 0 0.001 is so small that the evidence is very much in favor. Where, if anywhere, can we draw the line? It is a matter of personal taste. Fisher says it's convenient to take this point as a limit in judging whether deviation is to be considered significant or not. If one in 20 doesn't seem high enough odds, we may draw it at one in 50 or one in 100. Um, and just to emphasize, when, when Fisher used the word significant here, he didn't mean um, important or true or real or any of those kinds of meanings that we attach to it now. He just meant something that was worth further exploration. And Cromer talks about purely conventional terminology. Uh, Fisher, again, sort of emphasized you know, how he interpreted those p-values. He interpreted them by context, OK? So a p-value in the 0.05 to 0.1 range Sometimes, depending on the context, he thought that was an effect that was worthy of more study, which is what he meant by significant. And sometimes he did not, again, depending on context. And this quotation um, from 1956 from um, his book for research methods um, really brings it, brings it forward. So in fact, no scientific worker has a fixed level of significance at which from year to year and in all circumstances, he rejects hypotheses. He rather gives his mind to each particular case in the light of his evidence and his ideas, and so on. So he's really quite strongly here says you do not use the same level of significance for every situation, but rather it should be tailored to the circumstances. And in fact, you wouldn't, I mean, you know, it, it, he makes it really actually very clear. It's absurdly academic for in fact, no scientific worker has a fixed level and so on. So this was what was going on hundred years ago. In spite of that, as we all know, P less than 0.05 has basically become the de facto uh, threshold in many areas of science. It's completely entrenched. And this is partly, it's a, it's a result of many things, um, history and sociology of science, but it's also a result of actually misunderstanding two prominent uh, approaches to hypothesis testing that were developed about the same time. Um, that one of Fisher, that we talked about a little bit and the alternative testing approach of Neyman and Pearson. And the way that we uh, do that many practitioners carry out statistical testing nowadays is sort of um, a melding or a, a mesh of these two approaches, okay? But they're actually quite different. So Fisher, in his approach to hypothesis testing, set up null hypothesis, based on that null hypothesis computed a p-value, and then based on the p-value, would assess whether further study was warranted, okay? Under Fisher's setting, there's no alternative hypothesis. There's only the null hypothesis. There's no consideration of type one and type two error rates, the, the level and the power of the tests. And there are no thresholds. You compute the p-value, you look at the p-value, you assess it on its own merits in the context of the problem. The name and Pearson approach, by contrast, sets two hypotheses. It sets a null and it sets an alternative. It sets as a result of having these two hypotheses, acceptable levels of what we now have with what we call type one and type two errors. So those are the two kinds of mistakes that you can make. Those are set in advance. Those are qualities of the test. You compute your test statistic and see if it falls into a rejection region that is defined by the components of the test, by the null, the alternative, the type one and type two errors. Under this scenario, you don't need a p-value, okay? So what we do now is we, you know, people tend to set up null and alternative hypotheses. They maybe talk about this type one error, that's the 0.05, the type two error, that's the power. Um, and, but we don't do this part. We don't, we, we don't compute the test statistic and see if it falls into the regression region. Rather, we compute the p-value, which comes from Fisher's uh, approach and then subject it to some kind of threshold. So it's kind of a mix of these of these two approaches. If you do a Google search 
on this general issue, you can find lots and lots and lots of papers and editorials covering a range of disciplines. Um, I've mentioned here just a few, sociology, psychology, and biology being prominent among them that deplore the use of arbitrary thresholds for the p-value and outlining the problems with this general approach. Um, you can find them from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, keep going back and you'll keep finding discussions of this problem and why this is not a good way to do statistical testing. So there have been attempts made over the years to reframe the discussion and they've largely been unsuccessful or of limited impact. And this is partly why I have the question mark in my title because I think some things have changed now, but it's not clear just how far, how far it will go. Part of what's different now though, compared to earlier times when people were talking about this problem is there's also this sort of pervasive sense that there's a crisis in science in a way that maybe there hasn't been before. Um, there have been some high profile cases um, of what is called harking, hypothesizing after the result is known and p-hacking. Um, I, I will just, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few here just um, but not, not to put any particular researchers sort of in the limelight, but again, these are some of these high profile uh, cases that have come out. So uh, about five years ago, the, uh, Brian Wunsink was a food researcher at Cornell University, and he published um, on, on his blog a, a story about the grad students who never said no, which was basically a story about p-hacking um, and some other questionable research practices. And Living in the times that we do, um, the internet blew up at him, and eventually he was actually forced to um, resign from his job at Cornell uh, because of questionable um, use of statistics, among other things. Um, there have been some high-profile cases uh, also around reproducibility and replicability, so notably um, some failures to replicate in cancer clinical trials, um, the Center for Open Science has a reproducibility project, and they've had some pretty high profile um, failures to replicate um, in psychology and cancer biology as well. Um, this uh, power pose uh, study that I've that I've mentioned here as well, if this is this is better to do when it's an in-person talk, then I can show you what the power pose looks like. But this is basically this idea that if you stand in a powerful position, powerful pose, uh, for like a minute or two before you have some, some big uh, events that it makes you uh, more, uh, more confident. And so there was a whole series of studies about this that those also fail to replicate after a lot of publicity around them. On the con uh, by contrast, uh, there was a study of ESP that was able to be replicated conceptually in a single lab. And so there's a sense of Maybe something is not quite right. And for us as statisticians, we started to ask, and other people also started to ask about the role of statistics and specifically this idea of having a threshold like P less than 0.05 as being a bar for publication. Like what is the effect of having that kind of threshold? Uh, you know, what does it do to, um, to the research process? Because if that is a standard that you need to attain to get your paper published or to get your grant proposal funded in this very cutthroat environment that we find ourselves, then this could lead directly, indirectly, consciously or unconsciously to maybe not such good practices. Um, so there's questionable research practices and p-hacking that I've mentioned already. Um, there's this notion of researcher degrees of freedom, which is that you can decide how to do your data analysis. And again, it's not necessarily that you're trying to do something wrong or underhanded. It's just, well, you make decisions and along the way, this is a natural part of what we do when we analyze data. And what's the effect of that? And in addition to all of these things, there have been many signs of abuse of statistical methods in the literature. To make things as if this wasn't bad enough, to make them worse, um, p-values are actually widely misunderstood. They have a technical mathematical de definition that is not very intuitive. And no matter how we try to explain to our students, it's really hard to get across what a p-value actually means. Um, and there's been studies that, that demonstrate this as well. So I'm just gonna mention a few of them here. Um, so Gigerenzer in 2004, did a study of psychology researchers and students, 
And he found that almost all of them had misconceptions about what a p-value is and what a p-value measures. And that included people that taught statistics, okay? More recently, um, McShane and Gal also um, looked at applied researchers in biomedical and social science and found that they misuse and misinterpret p-values. And that includes um, statisticians among them. Now, statisticians, not necessarily someone with a PhD in statistics, um, not to say that people with PhDs in statistics don't make these mistakes as well, but you know, it's, 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 these are widespread errors. Um, one of my favorite examples uh, of this is in a paper published by Gao a couple of years ago. So he looks at an article that was published in JAMA uh, about of medical residents. And he, you know, so this, this paper that was published in JAMA of medical residents found that 88% of residents expressed fair to complete confidence in understanding p-values, but they all had the interpretation incorrect. The sort of funny twist in this paper was that the, the people that wrote the paper, so Gao is talking about another paper that was published in JAMA. So the people that wrote the paper that was published in JAMA had, you know, like this questionnaire talking, asking residents about interpretations of statistical concepts like p-values, and they had picked out in their little multiple choice test, choice C as being the correct answer. Um, and Gao points out that choice C is also not correct. So the residents didn't understand what p-values were. The authors of the paper about the residents also didn't understand what p-values were. And the peer reviewers and editorial board of JAMA also apparently did not understand what p-values were because none of them caught the mistake and this got published. So. Um, these are just some examples. There are many others that you can find. So p-values are a hard concept to understand, and that, that definitely makes the problem worse. So all of this was going on. Um, and against this background, the American Statistical Association put together a committee of experts to discuss the use and abuse and misuse of statistics. And the statement, the 2016 statement on p-values was the result of those discussions. At the time, I was the editor of the American Statistician um, and the ASA executive director asked me if the American Statistician would be willing to publish this ASA statement on p-values. So, you know, as the editor, of course, I felt like I had a responsibility to my readers, to the readers of the journal and to um, the editorial board of the journal. So I didn't wanna just say, yes, we're gonna publish this. Um, I wanted to think about how to make it into a real American statistician paper, not just a policy statement. And so I had the idea to invite discussion. And what we ended up doing was we invited all of the members of that original um, ASA committee to contribute pieces, which, um, we did because not all of the members of the committee actually agreed with the statement. And I thought it would be really interesting to get perspectives. And so almost all of them agreed, not everybody did. And so you can still find um, this online discussion, which is individual pieces written by the members of the committee that put together the statement about why they agreed, disagreed, disagreed, and where they disagreed and so on. Up to that point, I also hadn't really been so aware of all of these issues. And I kind of knew a little bit about this, you know, this, this um, reproducibility crisis and that yes, people don't understand p-values very well and sometimes don't use statistics very well. But all of this brought a greater awareness to me and to the community about some of these issues. So here, in case you haven't seen them before, um, the ASA statement on p-values includes six principles, which I've just put out here. Um, you can find those in the American Statistician as well. Uh, and these are the points that the members of the committee could sort of more or less mostly agree on, although again, not everybody agreed on, not everybody agreed on everything. Um, I'm going to read them through for you so that we can, um, so that you can sort of hear them rather than just reading them. So p-values can indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model, how incompatible the data are. They do not measure, this is number two refers to a very common, to very common misinterpretations of p-values. They don't measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true. They don't measure the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. Number three kind of gets at the heart of a reform movement that is now sort of going on. Number three and four, I would say. So scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold and proper inference requires full reporting and transparency. Um, 
And then number five, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, is there a question? Okay. So do you want to try running the R, Hila? Um, I think someone may have uh, accidentally left themselves unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, number five, a p-value or statistical physical significance? No, 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 it's the R markdown. Go back to your um, folders. Can you please mute the Scroll microphone, please? Further. Yeah, in the weekly report. Uh -huh. The host should be able to mute the them. Okay. Oh, I'm not the host. I can't. See, I think it's further than that. So it hasn't been updated in a while. Um, okay, p-value statistical significance doesn't measure the size of the effect or the importance of a result. Again, this is a common misinterpretation. And by itself, it does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. So I'm going to talk about around some of these issues um, in, in the rest of the talk. Building on the momentum and the conversation that the ASA statement um, started, in 2017, there was a symposium on statistical inference that brought together statisticians and researchers from a wide range of disciplines, again, with a wide range of perspectives. And the focus of the symposium was whether there's a problem with how statistical inference is commonly conducted. If it, there is a problem, is it a serious problem? And if it's a serious problem or a problem at all, what are some possible solutions? And this was really what led into the special issue of the American Statistician in 2019 that Venkat mentioned at the beginning. So I was no longer the editor at this point. Um, but the editor at the time, Dan Jeske, did agree to put together this special issue on statistical inference in the 21st century, a world beyond P less than 0.05. And what we did is we, we invited papers from the participants in the symposium, and we also had an open call to the statistics community so that anybody who wanted to submit a paper uh, in principle could. We got lots of submissions. Um, and uh, the co-editors of the special issue, uh, the three of us, read through all of them with a great uh, team of associate editors and many, many referees that agreed to help us out. Um, and indeed, in the final issue, there's 43 papers with many good suggestions on how to move forward in publication practices, in education practices, in statistical inference more generally. Um, I would just emphasize that we uh, got an agreement with the publisher so that the journal, the whole issue, excuse me, um, is open access. It's all published online only. There's no paper version of it. It's all online, but it's all open access and it's freely available forever for everyone. So if you're interested, you can go to the American Statisticians website and look through the papers yourself. So what can we do? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about philosophies on this slide and on the next slide, a little bit about like practical things. So in terms of the philosophies, there's sort of a, a gamut, okay, going from the most extreme, which is to ban p-values altogether, and there are some people that are advocating for that, all the way to keeping the status quo. Uh, where we fall in our editorial is on the somewhat radical side. Um, we advocate to keep the p-values. So we're not, we don't think to ban p-values, keep them, but avoid thresholding and avoid declarations of statistical significance. Other um, people suggest to keep the p-values, but lower that default threshold for declaring statistical significance from 0.05, which is seen as maybe too lenient, to 0.005, um, which uh, also has some justification from um, a Bayesian perspective. It corresponds a little bit more closely to what people think about, think that 0.05 means. Um, and, it's a, and it's a more stringent threshold. Um, 72 authors signed on to this paper. Um, another suggestion is very much hearkening back to um, Fisher's idea of keeping the p-values, but picking whatever um, threshold you're going to use according to circumstances and context, the so-called justify the justify your alpha approach. Um, and again, that has a fair bit of support. And then sort of least radical is to keep the status quo, that is keep p-values, keep statistical significance, keep thresholding, but do a better job of educating uh, students, educating the public, educating practitioners. So this is a whole range of things that statisticians have um, suggested from a sort of a philosophical stance. 
In terms of methods, um, again, a variety of suggestions that appear in the special issue have started to appear more generally in the published literature. Um, for instance, using Bayes factors or other Bayesian method measures, um, using the so-called S value, which is a, su a surprisal value. Um, this is just the log of the log base two minus log base two of the P value. And this is like um, how surprised how surprised you would get be, how much information you get. Um, tossing a coin, tossing a fair coin, and observing some number of heads in a row. So for instance, the S value of 0 0.05 is 4.3, which means that it's roughly the same as tossing a coin that you think is fair, observing four heads in a row, would you then think that the coin is not fair, okay? Maybe not. And so 0 0.05 might not be that strong evidence uh, or might not be that surprising of a result. Other suggestions are, are sort of a little bit more technical, things like a false positive risk, so-called so second generation p-values, and on and on. And as I said, um, there's other suggestions in the special issue. People have now started to kind of dig into this as a research topic as well and making other suggestions. So there's a lot of ideas out there and it can be quite confusing. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the, this special issue gives us many alternatives to traditional practice. And this is confusing. It's confusing uh, and it's a little bit difficult, I, I, I recognize, um, both for statisticians and for practitioners. And I think where it's gonna go, and again, this is just a prediction, so I don't know if this is how it's really gonna play out in, in the end, but I don't think that there's gonna be a simple one size fits all solution. I think it's entirely possible that different disciplines could arrive at different best practices. And as long as those are informed um, statistically and not just arrived at in some arbitrary fashion, I think that's fine. I mean, it's just, I, don't think it, I don't think everybody needs to be doing the same thing from a statistical point of view, as long as whatever we end up doing is justified. And no matter what we end up doing, we, I think there are certain best practices that will evolve and they should ad adhere to some strong principles. And so in our editorial, we, we put out the atomic principles. So A in the atomic stands for accepting uncertainty. Um, the p-value, it's a function of our data. So it is a random variable. And so that means that it's subject to noise, okay? Um, the T, the O, and the M for Adam in the Adam part stands for being thoughtful, open, and modest. This connects to the open science um, movement, which is gaining in popularity in some, in some areas now. Um, and really what we're calling for is reporting what you've done. Report more information, not less. And that's doable nowadays because we're not necessarily bound by the limitations from um, you know, paper journal page limitations. We can put on stuff online as well. Um, and so we can really report the fullness of what we've done. And then also we really need to just recognize that one study doesn't present a complete picture. We need to replicate, we need to reproduce, we need to build up um, the complete picture from the pieces that come into it. Related to that, we wanna avoid exaggerated claims in either direction about the importance of an effect if we have a quote unquote small p-value or statistical significance or the lack thereof. Okay, so we don't wanna have exaggerated claims in either direction. We wanna focus on the substantive implications of the estimates and intervals. So instead of just having, you know, oh, we, we, hit, we hit some p-value, so we're good, really think about the data and really think about the scientific questions. So it's putting the focus back on the science. And then the last part um, in the atomic, uh, is the institutional change recognizing that this is hard. So we need to get buy-in from journals and funding agencies as well, if this is really gonna make a difference in the long run. I wanna emphasize that the p-value is not the problem, okay? The p-value is, is clearly and obviously a valid statistical tool. So if that's not the problem. The problem is this bright line thresholding and no matter what measure, what, no matter what statistical measure you use, you could apply some strict threshold. And that's gonna to lead to exactly the same problems as we've been talking about and exactly the same problems that we've seen with the p-value also. So I wanna put this question out 
to you if you haven't thought about this before. What do we gain by attaching this label of statistical significance? What does it give us beyond what we already have? If we've looked at the sizes of effects, if we've looked at measures of uncertainty on those effects, if we've looked at the p-values themselves, if we have well-crafted plots that tell us about the data, what does that label of statistical significance give us that we don't already have? Okay, so if you haven't thought about that point yet, I would, I would strongly urge you to, because I think it's very, for me, it was very enlightening to think about things in that way. Um, and then again, sort of as another take home message, you know, we, tools are used in situations for which they weren't suited, they're misinterpreted. All of this makes everything much more complicated. Okay, so what's going on? Um, some journals are modifying how they want statistical results to be reported and are starting to remove the language of statistical significance. I've mentioned a few here. Um, pediatric anesthesia, demographic research, Journal of Wildlife Management. Uh, about a week or two ago, I, someone sent me um, an editorial that was written by um, the journal editors of, I think, all the major physiotherapy journals. And they've also all now um, say they want to remove statistical significance and focus more on effect sizes and interpretation and so on. Um, an extreme uh, of this um, is actually in the banning p-values camp that I mentioned earlier. Um, the journal Basic and Applied Social Psychology in 2015 banned the use of p-values altogether as not, and not just p-values, but all vestiges of the so-called null hypothesis statistical testing paradigm, which are p-values, t-values, f-values, statements about significant differences and so on. So this is a very extreme um, stance. Individual researchers are some of them also changing how they report their statistical analysis. Um, and I point here to Adrian Barnett, who I believe was um, president of the Australian Statistical Association. About a year and a half ago uh, on his blog, he wrote that he was sort of getting tired of his um, collaborators pushing so much on p-values, p-values, p-values. And then when he pressed them, they didn't really understand what a p-value was. And so he decided for a year, he was not gonna let his name be on any paper that used p-values. And he put a challenge to his collaborators and said, okay, it's either me or the p-values. And a few months ago, he reported on the results of that little experiment, his year without p-values. And all but one of his collaborative groups said they wanted him as co-author and they dumped the p-values. And one, one group was not willing to dump the p-values and so, he was not included as a co-author because he refused. Um, so people are, people are experimenting, I guess is the way to put it, with all sorts of different approaches. Other people are not, and the other journals are not. So some are kind of sticking with the status quo and others are taking an intermediate stance. Okay, it's nice, really, this is a time of great flux because change is hard and it does take time. So yet another twist in this whole story um, is uh, in 2021. So last summer came out the report of this task force on significance and replicability, which was a task force that was convened by the 2019 ASA president. They issued their report in June 2021, which emphasized the usefulness of p-values and significance testing. And I've bolded here um, a phrase that appears repeatedly throughout their short report when properly applied and interpreted which is a very strong caveat. Um, I think you know, a big part of what the reform movement is arguing is that these ideas are not properly applied and they are not properly interpreted. If they were, then maybe there wouldn't be a problem, but they're not, and so this is a very strong caveat. And so again, it comes back to this question about whether thresholds are useful and under what circumstances. So this is an ongoing conversation. Um, for the statisticians in the audience, especially, but, but not only, um, because there's been so much going on in the last few years, there has been some misunderstanding. Um, so I want to just clarify that of, of the various things that I've mentioned, the only one that's an official statement of the American Statistical Association that has the backing that was voted on by the board and is, is, is an official statement is the 2016 statement on p-values. 
the, the editorial in the American Statistician and the material in that special issue are not official statements of the, of the ASA. We thought we made that clear, but there has been some uh, misunderstanding, especially about the editorial being an official statement of the ASA, but it's not, it's just an editorial that we wrote. Likewise, the report of the task force that came out in 2021 is also not an official statement of the ASA. Okay, so it's only the 2016 statement that's, that's an actual official fact statement of the American Statistical Association. All the rest of it is just individuals' opinions. So if you've made it this far, you might be wondering, okay, so people have been doing things this way for decades. Why can't we just keep on? Um, if you're not convinced yet, um, I want to give you an example. And there's, there's lots of examples that I could have pulled in, um, especially from the last couple of years, but I'm going to go back a little bit further than that. Um, around a little after the editorial came out, um, I was contacted by um, Janet Hapgood, who's a researcher at the University of Cape Town. And she told me about this um, so-called ECHO trial, which was a big uh, trial looking at um, HIV and AIDS in uh, South Africa and connections with um, certain types of contraceptives that are, were available to women. And it was a very long, expensive trial. And she was really um, concerned about how some of the results from that trial were interpreted. And so she contacted me because she wanted to make sure that her interpretation was correct and because she wanted to write a rebuttal to um, some of the publicity and conclusions that were being drawn from the people who, who conducted the ECHO trial because she thought they were wrong. Okay, and I've highlighted just a few points here. Um, I'm not an HIV researcher. I don't know about, you know, different types of contraceptives and their connection um, to HIV acquisition. So I'm highlighting the statistical aspects. Okay, so we have a hazard ratio of 1.23 um, with a confidence interval. So they report a confidence interval. That's great. Of 0.95 to 1.59. And they actually, they give us the p-value as well. They don't just say p less than 0.1 or p less than something. They give us the p-values. That's good for one treatment compared to another. Two different types of um, implants, I think, contraceptive implants. And then they, another analysis, a hazard ratio of 1.29. Again, they give the confidence interval 0.98 to 1.71. And again, they did give the p-value. And the authors conclude that they did not, we did not find a substantial difference in HIV risk among the methods evaluated and all methods were safe and highly effective. They further recommend that these results support continued and increased access to the three contraceptive methods. The problem here, um, which again, I hope that we, you know, we've now established enough of, uh, of a common language that you can see for yourselves what the problem is, but if not, I just wanna point out, they, give me the hazard ratio, which is great. They give me the exact p-values, which is great. They give me the confidence intervals for those hazard ratios, which is also great. But then their interpretation focuses solely on the fact that these hazard ratios include one, which is the no difference, okay? But in fact, the hazard ratios span values less than one up to quite a bit greater than one. Here, very borderline, close to one, up to much greater than one. And so there's a range of values that are compatible, not just one with the data, okay? So it's possible that one of these implants versus the other is mildly beneficial or very harmful, okay? And they're completely just ignoring that possibility and saying, well, they're all the same. Okay, so this could have obviously real implications for um, the health of, of women. Okay, and again, we can find these things repeatedly. And so it's not enough to just report a confidence interval like in this case, but you wanna can think about what does it mean in terms of the compatibility? What values are compatible with the data that have been observed? And there's a whole range of them. Okay, and not just focusing, focusing on just that one value is basically the same problem again. All right, so XKCD to the rescue again, what comes next? Good question. Um, education, I think, um, is something that needs to evolve. Both the education of statisticians and the education that we provide to scientists. And in my perspective on this, and again, this is just my own opinion, uh, sort of as I've been thinking about these issues over the last few years, is that, well, science isn't static. And the data that we collect today 
are larger and more complex than Fisher and his comrades and colleagues ever could have imagined. And the methods that we use to analyze those data are also much different than the methods that were developed 100 years ago. So why should our conclusions and our inference, why should statistics be done the same way that it was in the past? We need to evolve and change as well. So this is this idea of institutional change and conversation. Um, and I've been having those conversations. I've been really lucky to be, to be um, involved with many interesting projects that are trying to bring this idea of change into different areas of science. It's been a lot of fun. Um, the statement, the ASA statement and the lead editorial in the special issue continue to garner amounts of views and citations that are just unheard of in statistics. And so this is a sign, I think, at least at some level that people are paying attention, even if they're not agreeing with us, they're at least reading uh, what, what the statisticians have to say here. Um, and again, there's lots of conversation that's taking place in all sorts of places, um, in the pages of journals, at conferences, among statisticians, between statisticians and scientists, which is part of what I've been doing over the last couple of years is, is talking to a lot of scientists um, and science writers and, and thinking about how do we, how do we get to that post P less than 0.05 world, um, assuming that we want to, which I think we do. And what are the best ways to be thinking about how we report uh, results if we're not gonna be relying on these thresholds anymore? And so that's what I have to say. Um, I think we have some time for questions. So um, yeah, I'll open it up to the, to the group. Thank you, Nicole. That's a, a very nice summary of, uh, of the entire field. It almost sounds like the Protestant movement uh, in, <laughs> in, in, in Catholic countries anyway. So, uh, you know, just to, uh, on one practical note, if you can bring back that slide on the echo trial, the one, the last few slides that you had, uh, the one before, the, the one yeah. before, yeah, this one. Okay, now, okay. Uh, I mean, just for, uh, just for language purposes, how might you frame or, uh, or interpret the result? I mean, how would you describe it? I mean, to describe compatibility rather than uh, just dichotomy. Yeah, um, that's a great that's a great question, and one that comes up obviously repeatedly. Because if we're going to say you know talk about this and the whole gamut, then talk. How do you? What language do you use? Um, you know, so for me, I would probably say something like the data are compatible with everything ranging from a small harm, depending on who's on the numerator and who's on the denominator, small harm to great benefit of one of the treatments over the other. And again, that will de depend on the context, but here that, that would be something that, I, that you could say. And I mean, can you go a step further? Can you uh, come up with a probability of uh, the lower and upper bounds? Well, those lower and upper bounds here in the interval are the things that are random, of course. So I'm not quite sure I guess I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, what probabilities on on these, like for? So how likely is your, uh, you know, a harm, a harm of 0.95, and how likely is your benefit of? 1.5? Oh, um, that's a hard. That's a harder question. In fact, I'm not. I don't have a, a ready answer to that one. So that that is, I think, something that probably needs some additional statistical methodology development to be able to say that these. Are, I mean, these are random variables, and so it involves. It would involve studying what these random variables look like. Okay, but I think in terms of sort of interpreting, I think for for many situations, it's probably okay to just add that expanded language about, you know, benefit versus harm um, and, and taking it that way. Because both are compatible, right? Because, because the interval does span one, that means it's possible that there's some small benefit or small harm. It's possible that there's great benefit or great harm on the other direction. So I think just, just acknowledging that. And, you know, the p-values here in both instances are pretty small. Um, and so that's other information as well, right? I mean, it's, this is not, but they're, you know, these authors here seemed in the echo trial seem to be focusing more on the fact that this P is less, is greater than 0.05, and this P is greater than 0.05, and the interval covers one. And so there's nothing here to see, which is not the conclusion that you want to get. 
Thanks, Nicole. There are a number of questions on chat and people mm-hmm. have questions. I mean, do you want to uh, stop share screening so that we can look at each oh, other? Oh, sure. Uh, okay. So you want to take the question from this chat first? Or? Uh, sure. And I see a couple of people have their hands up as There's well. One from Rachel. And, uh, okay. Um, all right. Let's see. I'm going to go, uh, I guess, from the back. Oh, so I'm going to start at the top. So Amel Amari asks, um, what it might look to justify your alpha? What types of reasons might researchers offer to select one threshold over another? Great question. Um, so I think the idea here is that you know, there's going to be some situations where you need to have a great deal of certainty that you're not making a type one error. Okay. So you're not falsely rejecting that null hypothesis. And so um, for instance, in um, some areas of physics, they need to have very, very high, uh, sorry, very, very low alpha levels because they're, you know, because of type science that they're doing. So 0.05 for them is just not even nearly close enough. And so they routinely will use much smaller um, significance levels to be able to say, oh, we've detected a new particle or, or whatever it is. Um, in genomic w- research, where you're looking at lots and lots of genes simultaneously, you might want each one to, to hit, uh, if before you declare that gene to be interesting or significant or whatever, you might want your level to be much, much smaller as well, because you're looking at so many of them and the implications are potentially um, important. There could be other situations where you don't need to have that level. So it really needs to depend on the context and it needs to depend on your knowledge um, as a practitioner. Okay, so does that uh, answer the question? Yes, it does, thank you. Okay, great. Um, Let's see, do you have any thoughts about how to plan randomized trials in light of wanting to avoid binary thresholds or interpretation at the analysis stage? Um, so I don't think the design is, is necessary. I mean, I don't think the design is, is relevant here in the sense that the, the, the interpretation and the thresholding comes at that later stage. So, but it, but it is tricky. So I, you know, I'm teaching, last year I was teaching our graduate uh, course in experimental design. I'm teaching it again this year. And it's very, it's very challenging. It was very challenging for me as well to think about, well, how do I teach this, this material without bringing in those questions? Because, you know, if you do an analysis of variance, for instance, from some randomized trial, and then you find a difference among the, among the treatments, and then you want to go back in and look and see which ones are different, and you do all this multiple test, multiple comparisons, and it's like all of these issues are sort of wrapped up in there. Um, so, but again, that's, that's more of the analysis, and it's less the, the design stage and the planning. So you can still do randomized trials. I think that's still a really good thing to do. That's still going to be our gold standard. Um, and so I don't, I guess I don't really see that as being, as being a problem. Uh, so I'm not sure if that answered your question, uh, Bizad, I hope it did. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Ambar, how do scientists communicate to the public with differing opinions <laughs> regarding interpretation of p-values? Um, so I think we need to be really careful here, um, Ambar, because, um, there's an the p value has a specific interpretation. The differing opinions come with how do we use the p values? And that's a much more subtle kind of discussion to have. And yeah, we need to be really careful about it. Um, I, I agree. Uh, I, you know, one of the first talks I gave on all of this was actually to um, a group of science writers and they were very interested in, you know, okay, so how do we how do we make people understand this? It's really complicated, and it is complicated. But I think being open and just kind of explaining that these are subtle issues and doing the best we can, I, which I know is not uh, is not um, a super fantastic strong answer. But right now, that's kind of where we are. I think it. I think trying to make it seem as if everybody is doing the same thing and on the same page ultimately does a disservice to science because then when there are disagreements, people will say, well, you guys don't know what you're talking about. So I think it's okay to have that conversation and just be open about it. Um, I don't know, Ambar, did that help to answer the question a little bit? Yeah, thank you. It did, uh, but you know, I, you know, there's an attraction 
of having like a summary, you know, estimate and yep. the simplicity and even the 0.05, if it's a commonly agreed standard for a particular area, I think it helps. My yeah. co concern becomes that if you start all justifying, oh, I'll have this alpha for my my area, then again, it you the objectivity gets lost and then people are then trying to, you know, overemphasize their conclusions in other ways by writing very verbose discussion Absolutely. sections. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that in fact is one of the um, counterclaims to sort of this idea of reform is that, well, if everybody's going to do their own thing, then there's going to be even more mistakes, um, you know, especially like with this justifying your alpha or whatever, which is why I don't think that, personally, I don't think that's the solution. I would rather just give me your p-values, give me all that information, explain to me what you did, explain to me how much, you know, how certain you are and so on, and then I can make my decision. So I think, you know, that greater transparency is what's going to lead us hopefully to a better place. Great, thanks. Yeah, um, Thad too. I work in human-computer interaction, have begun teaching my students how to code a permutation test. Yeah, instead of doing students T or Welch's T because it better models the actual distribution is part of a problem with p-values that scientists make too many assumptions about the distributions. Um, I, I don't think I don't think so. I mean, I've been actually doing the same thing, Thad. Um, I've been also using much more of a simulation-based approach than in that I might have previously because it also gives students a much better feel for like what the data could reasonably look like and where things might go wrong. Um, so the, I, I completely agree with the approach. I like it, I do it myself. I don't think though that that's the problem. I mean, it's, it's sorry, it's part of the problem, yeah, because people, I think when they, you know, the, the p-value that you compute is not just a function of the hypotheses, it's also a function of the models. And that's a part that gets overlooked. And so I think there's that interpretation issue, right? I mean, you compute a p-value for a t-test, that's assuming they've got a certain data distribution, there's a model there, okay? That p-value is no longer valid if the model isn't valid for your data. So some of those issues come into play for sure. I mean, but I think model it's a of, issue. Do you mean a model, can you explain it more? I mean, the uh, model of how, the different conditions differ or the model of the distribution of the data? The model of the distribution of the data. Got it. Yeah. Rachel, um, I find that clinical journals are slower in picking up new methods or insight. Authors are held by journal standards. Editors need to insist on change. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Rachel, I, uh, I've been collecting editorials from um, different journals as I've been finding them. If you shoot me an email, I can give you a list of the ones that I have. I don't know if, I don't know if they're clinical um, per se, but that might give a little bit more information I, I, if that would be helpful. I don't off the top of my head know, know um, what those are, but I've been collecting them. So if you, if, you. if you email me, I'm happy to pass some of that along for you. Will do, thank you. Okay. Um, what do I report? Oh, that again. What do we suggest reporting? Mean, standard deviations, confidence interval, p-values? Yes. <laughs> Basically, the more you can give me in terms of information, if you give me effect sizes, I want to have an, a, an, an uncertainty estimate on that effect size, plot the data. Yeah, just, just everything that can help me to gain some insight into what the data are telling me. I want to see it. What are my thoughts when p-values are compared? Don't do it. <laughs> Basically, that's not what they're meant for. Um, people do it. I think it's not great. Um, box two for an interesting plot. Okay, I'm going to have to take a look at that. I'll put that up on my thing. Why not shift entirely to Bayesian methods? Um, that won't solve the problem because if I apply a threshold to a Bayes factor or some other Bayesian method, then I'm going to be right back in the same situation. If you talk about a full Bayesian analysis, where again, you show the whole posterior distribution of your estimates and you interpret everything in context, that's fine. But in practice, that's probably not what people would end up doing. And so we just need to be really careful about not falling into the same kinds of problems just with different statistical measures. Um, oh, okay, comments are just flying through here. Let me see. How would I explain in a very simple way to a non-statistician? 
Oh, I assume we have, do we have a time limit here? Should I just go through all the questions or should I try to- Nicole, Yeah, you can go, I have to leave if I may, and I have another meeting starting in a minute, but, uh, but carry on but, and I'll be okay. in touch with you. Thank you very much, okay. Nicole, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Okay, um, I guess I'll, I'll try to get through as many of the questions as I can before attendance just drops off. <laughs> um, is Philip still here? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Um, how would you explain in a very simple way to a non-statistician the proper interpretation of a p-value? Oh, uh, <laughs> it is tough to explain um, simply yet accurately. Um, I guess what I would try to do is go back to the ASA principles and um, use that as a basis rather than trying to get into like the truly technical definition because the truly technical definition is extremely hard to understand even for stat students and even for others. And so I think what I would do is rather than trying to explain the sort of mathematical idea behind it, um, I, I might just say like, you know, this is what it does and this is what it doesn't do. Maybe I could say something so far as, you know, if I would repeat this study again, you know, what, how might I, would I be likely to see as extreme of a result as I did in this particular study. You know, people people sort of know, I mean, and maybe, yeah. So, I mean, I might try to do something like that. It's, it's hard though. Um, so we need to come up with some language on that. And I think this ties into Melinda's next point that we need to get better at communicating uncertainty. Yeah, mm-hmm. Um, it's a bright line to get a yes, no answer. It's almost never a yes, no answer. We should get better at reporting and communicating confidence intervals and credible intervals. I completely agree. And that might help with some of these issues as well. Um, consumers of science are different from producers of science. Yes, 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 yes. How do I like to describe the p-value? I think I've talked about this already. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, the I don't know if Jess is still here. Yes, Jess is still here. The talk is being recorded. I don't know about availability. The people, you have to ask the people organizing. Um, oh, there we go. It's Mark has point, posted where it's going to be. Uh, okay, I think. Okay, I think I've hit the questions of everyone who's still, who's still here um, in, in the chat. Uh, if there's anybody that wants to um, ask any other questions or have any other discussion, I guess I can I can hang on for a while longer. I I just added something if I may. Oh yeah. Um, oh, cross validation. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I'm also a machine learning researcher, yep. and um, my students and most people in machine learning literature, you know, say, oh, my method got you know ninety five percent accuracy, whereas this other method only got ninety three percent accuracy, and it drives me nuts. Um, because it's like, does it, did it matter? Um, you know, then there's this, does it matter in real life versus if I, if I did that same experiment, would I get the same result? Yeah. Um, so one thing I suggest my students to do is, you know, we do n-fold cross-validation. Are, are yep. you familiar with the concept? Yep. Okay. I have my students do that too. <laughs> we're, 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 we got, we got, you know, the ability to do million, literally millions of these things because mm -hmm. there's enough you know, oftentimes you have enough data, you can actually do lots of info cross validation. Yeah. And you get a mean and standard deviation. And you can actually say, you know, you can actually show those distributions and you can apply all the standard stuff we do in behavioral sciences. Yep. Is that legit with cross validation? Yeah, I do that all the time as well, actually. Yeah. Um, and especially when, I, when I'm teaching, because um, again, I think it's a really good way of getting students to understand this uncertainty, right? That is swept under the swept under the rug uh, a lot of the times in how we report on our results. And so do you know doing cross-validation, um, doing other types of simulation, I think are really powerful tools. Yes, I've I've used and I've used them as well. Yeah. Well then let me add something else to it. So the, the you know, cross-validation is great, but we all know now, especially with the neural net stuff and deep learning stuff, it's easy to delude yourself. Yeah. It's easy to overfit by tweaking hyperparameters yep. during your cross validation. Yep. Um, and so you always have a holdout that, but then you yep. only have one shot to say this method got 87% and this method got 80%. Yeah. And um, what do you, do you have any suggestions on how to 
you know, apply uh, to, to report the holdout sets in those cases? To report the Report holdout? results the holdout sets. Because all I'm saying is, you know, the holdout set that was after my parameter tuning for both of these methods, so I parameter tuned both of them the best I could. One got 87%, one got 80%. And, you know, given my cross validation showed that, you know, uh, uh, there's actually a difference in the, in the means and here's the distributions. I really believe this, um, the, the holdout set is showing me something real here too. That's yeah. the best I can come out with. Is there something better you would suggest? I mean, I guess doing again, like as, as, as you said before about doing things repeatedly and then you can kind of get a sense of, of that variability. Um, I think there's another, there's some, there's, there's three, there's a way of doing it in sort of three stages, which I've never looked at um, in detail where you have a training set, you have a testing and a validation set. So you kind of split yeah, that. That's, that's that. my holdout set. That's your holdout set. Okay. Yeah. I think, okay. Other people call it something else. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, it's all, the terminology is broken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, and you can do that repeatedly as well, right? No, no, once you're valid, the thing is that um, I can do my cross validation. Uh, generally in machine learning, what you do is you take, if I have a hundred things, yeah. I'll take out 90 randomly um, for my pruning and my cross validation and reserve 10% that I never look at uh, until the end. So I'm oh, not oh, doing oh. that. Okay. So then with um, my 90% left, I break that into 81, 81% uh, and 9%. Got it. And I got do it. that. Lots and lots times. of times. Yeah. And I get a distribution of me. Yeah, yeah. And I say, okay, I believe that I've done the best I can with my parameter tuning. Oh. But I could have parameter tuned to that specific set. Yeah. Um, and then when I apply it to my, my what I call my holdout or uh, the validation set. Um, I see. I could completely get different results, right. which is not, which is common. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, it's a little bit outside of my my area of, of um, sort of focus. Um, okay. I guess you know it all comes. I think a lot of it just comes down to getting getting a sense of the variability and the uncertainty in whatever estimates that you have. And so, if there's a way to do that somehow, like within this, that would be a way. Well, that then I, then you, do, you start you start doing the way you would do that. In, in my case, if I'm doing. Uh, for a user dependent model and say sign language recognition, which is my thing, I make a model for 20 people mm. and I do that validation 20 times for the 20 people. That's the, re that's the reproducibility and I can prove something on that. that. But generally you don't do that. Usually, usually you're doing a user independent system. And, Got it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yep. And, and if I, if I may, uh, uh, and that's somebody else, if somebody else wants to break in, please tell me, cause I have one other question that I'm dying to know. <laughs> um, and since I have a statistician in front of me, I should ask. Um, uh, so when you do, right now I'm using something called NASA Task Load Index, which is ancient. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No. It's, uh, it's an overall statistic that says how much um, workload is one condition versus another. So, you know, if I do something like being able to repeat back, uh, I have a list of, of digits and I ask you to, at a moment's notice, repeat the last one you heard mm. versus the second to last one you heard versus the third to the last one you heard. The mental effort is significantly oh, higher well, yeah. on one versus another. Okay. Same thing for like, you know, whack-a-mole uh, type of things which are, are physical. And so the NASA TLX has six subscales, mental, physical, effort, frustration, you know, this sort of thing. Um, and it puts into an overall workload. And so oftentimes you'll just do a, um, you know, you use like have three different conditions. You do a, a an ANOVA, right? And show there's difference in the conditions. And then you do, uh, so I guess that's the first part of the question. If I have like three conditions and I do an ANOVA on it for, uh, you know, 20 participants. So it's a uh, one way within subjects mm -hmm. or repeat measures ANOVA. And I get that value, right? It comes out that there's some difference in my ANOVA. Great, wonderful, who cares? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the pairwise stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the pairwise is already reported as a post hoc. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, and is that, so to me that says, okay, I knew there was going to be a difference in my three conditions. I did my, my post hoc, but that means I really should do more experiments just directly comparing the two things that came up. Um, right. Yeah. That's interesting. That's, that's, that's how I teach my students. Is that correct? 
Well, so, I mean, so, right. So this gets back to the type one error uh, control again, which is kind of at the basis of a lot of this conversation. And how do you control for the type, how do you control the overall like family wise type one error? And there are different, if you go into the statistical literature from the fifties where this was, you know, where this was developed, then there are ways um, for guaranteeing that type one family error Mm -hmm. control. Um, I think the other thing that you know, people are starting to maybe pay a little bit more attention to now is the difference between exploratory and confirmatory studies. So if you're just in purely exploratory mode, do what you want, but just don't claim statistical significance or anything like that for any of them. Don't, you know, and then use that to, to generate hypotheses for another study, which might be like just focusing on some of the pairwise ones like you're talking about. So you can do right. that. And, that. and that's, I have a student right now who's writing this stuff up and I'm saying, look, yeah. you had an a priori assumption that these two conditions we're going to have a difference. Right. So that's okay to report. Do it directly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You can just, re- yeah. you can do it directly, but you know, should he bother reporting the ANOVA to begin with there or just. That's going to depend on context and what your questions have been. That's, so that's not so much as, I mean, it's partly a statistical question, but that's also like a, a subject matter question. So it's going right. to be context dependent. Yeah. And, you know, for him, he actually had four conditions and he thought that condition one was going to be better than two, than three, than four. And, so ordered you know, hypotheses, that's another way that you can deal with these things. Sorry, what was that? You can order, you can have hypotheses that have order in them. Where do I find out more about that and how to report those? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Again, if you shoot me an email, I can um, get you some references on that. I don't know off the top of my head have them, but that's something that's that's been developed as well. Thank you. That's That was extremely helpful. I will probably pest you some more. That's uh, okay. Please uh, do. <laughs> uh, on this, because I'm, I'm about to ready to put some video lectures on this to get together. I don't want to mess it up. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you all who have stayed, I guess, till this point. <laughs> um, and it was really great um, having so many interested people here to, to learn about these things.